when you're outside. Oh, okay. Sorry, right. Uh, hello again, and uh, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to stray beyond the boundaries of Derbyshire and enter uh, God's own country, Yorkshire, uh, in a film about a hydraulic pumping engine at um, Gunnerside Gill, called Sir Francis Level. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's in Swaledale, actually, near a, a village called Reith, if you, if you want to go and have a look yourselves. Um, however, that's uh, under the leadership of Paul Chandler and the Mass and Caving Group, we headed off with a, a blow-up <laughs> blow boat, a little, little boat called Explorer 2. You can call it a dinghy. A dinghy, yeah. yes. <laughs> I thought you were going to say I'd blow up something else when I right. mentioned that. Anyway, we uh, we headed off with this little little boat to put all the um, filming stuff in because it was quite heavy to carry. We had a, a journey of a mile of flooded passage to go through before we got to the hydraulic pumping engine, which we managed uh, in waist deep water and uh, filmed the remains of this remarkable um, engine which is hidden away there, uh, you know, several hundred feet under the ground and miles from the actual uh, gill itself. And um, I started filming. And one of the reasons for wanting to film this was that they're in the Pictures Street Mines Museum in Matlow Bath. Uh, Frank um, Peel, an engineer, now, now no longer with us, had created this marvellous um, model of the pumping engine uh, that, that was on show in the museum. And it was quite an extraordinary thing, even with the little tools that he made for the workbench in the, in the chamber where the pump, pumping engine lives. Anyway, I hope you'll enjoy our wallowings and, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, we'll see you next time. Oh, um, just a quick reminder that uh, you know if you could subscribe to the channel it would be greatly appreciated as it, it would help the channel to grow and become more well become well known and so on and uh, yeah every little helps subscribe if you can thanks then and no extra costs oh yes i should have said that no, 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 no. <laughs> that's good Genocide, with its houses built of stone as hard as the old miners that once lived there, has been connected with the lead mining industry from the 16th right through to the 19th century. It lies at the junction of Swaledale and Gunnerside Gill, and Sir Francis Level, our destination, is just a short walk along the steep-sided gorge with its windswept tops and abundant evidence of a past way of life. The search for lead had no regard for beauty, although ironically the intervening centuries have healed the scars and created a uniquely dramatic and fascinating landscape, with its own brand of raw beauty. Shafts and openings that bored deep into the hillside tempt the inquisitive and properly equipped explorer, while the ruins of once busy mine buildings create an air of mystery and a puzzle for the uninitiated. Now indistinguishable from other natural features are these man-made cuts high upon the hilltops called hushes. They were created by the release of downed water which scoured the soil and loose rock as it tumbled down, hopefully uncovering a fresh vein of lead as it did so. We've chosen to follow the path running along the top of the gill, affording us magnificent views of the topography and mining remains. Features such as the ore bunkers down on the right indicate that we're approaching Sir Francis Level, which is the southernmost of the major workings. Lying further up are the mines of Lowenthwaite, Blackenthwaite and Old Gang. 
We're now at the level of the beck, and the gaunt outlines of one-time flourishing mine buildings come into close-up. This one was the mine office of A.D., or Arkendale and Darwin Company, of which Sir Francis Mine was part. Huge quantities of tailings from the ore dressing floors along the gill remain to this day, but the mineral content pollutes the soil, restricting the growth of plant life. This is the original portal to Sir Francis Level, but a major collapse blocked it not far in, so access is now a shallow shaft a few metres upstream. Because of the considerable distance we're to travel underground, we brought along a rubber boat to carry the filming equipment. Having partially pumped it up, it's carefully passed down to be loaded and launched. A few more pumps and we're ready for the off. Impatience being rewarded with a ducking in the cold black water. It's a bit deep, isn't it? The thing that Explorer got all the way back and it blew up just at the entrance. <laughs> Explorer <laughs> 2. <laughs> Sorry. What happened to Explorer 1? After all the commotion at the start, we're finally underway, and in just short of a mile, we'll be rewarded by the unique sight of an in situ 19th century hydraulic pumping engine. This long abandoned but remarkably intact monolith remains almost exactly as it was abandoned when the mine closed in the early 1900s. Cheery British pluck in evidence here as the discomfort of the intense cold is shunned. <laughs> Work on the 1.5 kilometre long level began in 1864 with the intention of intercepting rich veins at depth on the old gang veins, chief among them being the Furfold and Old Rake veins. This major venture was named in honour of Sir Francis Dennis, the son of Sir George Dennis, the driving force behind it. Progress was good at first, but then the geology changed and progress slowed, so that in five years they'd only driven 400 metres. The time-honoured method of hand drilling plus blasting with black powder meant that at this rate it'd take 25 years to complete. Something had to change. And so, in 1870, Sir George took it on himself to pioneer and fund the then revolutionary method of drilling shot holes using compressed air. The three-inch cast iron pipe that carried the air is still in place and can be seen to run the full length of the level. This, together with the use of dynamite, improved the rate of driving from 10 feet to 68 feet per month, with the exhaust air from the drills doing away with the need to sink expensive air shafts. The Lowe's double cylinder air compressor was powered by a 36 foot diameter water wheel installed near the portal to provide the compressed air for the drills. The receiver was of wrought iron and is amazingly still to be found close to where it was originally installed. A number of veins were intersected during the driving of the level and the water cascading from the roof here probably comes from one of them. The roof fall mentioned earlier has had the effect of backing up the water, though it gradually gets shallower the further in we go. Our little boat has served its purpose and was beached not far from this relic of the day when the level would have been mostly dry and was operated as a horse level. Oh, look at this! I haven't seen this before. What is it? I think it's a water butt for the horses. The level reached the rich Friarfold and Old Rake veins on March the 12th, 1877, after 13 years of hard labour and expense. Or extraction at depth began straight away, but production soon fell due to inefficient pumping methods. In a bold move, they invested a considerable sum on hydraulic pumping and winding engines, which they hoped would bring a change of fortune. Work on an engine room to house these mighty engines began in 1879, as did the work on this magnificent stone lining and the complex hydraulics 
which included a water feed from the surface. This is one of two cages used to haul ore and men from workings 40 metres below. The other is believed to be at the bottom of the now flooded shaft, which is timber lined and petitioned for the pump rods. The winding mechanism for the cages is in the main chamber, which we're to visit next. The chamber, which measures 11 metres by 5, roughly the size of your average semi, is at a high level and reached by a charming spiral stone staircase. It's hard to imagine turning up each day for work in a place like this. Cold, gloomy, permanently wet, and with an uncertain future. Plenty did it though, and it was in their blood. And some 200 men from Gunnerside alone worked in the mines around here for 12 shillings a week. Few lived beyond the age of 60. The sight emerging from the gloom as we enter is unforgettable and unreal. A huge wooden drum takes centre stage among a scene of industrial chaos with pipes, wires, beams, pulleys, levers and taps, all demanding inspection and putting into context. Unbelievably the whole thing is powered by water which drives the pump to drain the workings below and the horizontal winding engine to lift the cages up the shaft. The principle of the engine is based upon water pressure, which in turn is dependent upon the height of the column of water. From the diagram we see that the overall height is 160 metres from the reservoir to the floor of the engine room, more than enough to drive machinery that can lift two tonnes of ore 40 metres and pump out 500 gallons a minute. The remains of the 13-inch iron supply pipe can still be seen where it enters the shaft. It re-emerges below ground at the back of the room, where it splits to feed the horizontal winding engine and the vertical twin cylinder water pump. The stone wall at the far end has either collapsed or was an attempt to cover up the rough finish seen throughout the chamber. This is in marked contrast to the well-constructed arch that still stands and serves as a backdrop to the twin pump cylinders in this classic shot. It would be impossible, if not a little presumptive, were I to attempt an explanation as to how this iron leviathan works, and I am indebted to engineers such as Messrs Foster, Lodge and Crabtree for their scholarly analysis, available for those who wish to probe deeper. A look at the winding engine first, perhaps the more complex of the two engines. Water enters the chamber behind the man on the right and passes to one of two cylinders, the inner workings of which you've just seen in the diagram. Power is transmitted via the connecting rods to offset cams which drive the cogwheel and in turn the winding drum. Six turns of the cog equate to one of the drum, and there's enough wire rope to wind from 60 fathoms, but the shaft only ever reached a third of that. As one cage came up, the other went down, since both cables are attached to the one drum. Both cables are visible in this shot. The foot brake tensioned a strap against the drum, and the lever being gripped by this modern day explorer reverses the motion. The weight of the cage plus a normal two ton load required a hefty chain, and it's somewhat surprising that the overhead wooden beams and cage cables have lasted as well as they have. Unfortunately, the state of the cast iron components reflect the constant attack by damp. For those with a pause button and an hour to spare, I offer a detailed plan to pour over. Powerful video lights help to pierce the dark, but this room would have originally been lit by candles, perhaps suspended from the roof, and it's doubtful that the operators 120 years ago would see very much at all. The water feed pipes and control valves are much more obvious for the pumping engine, and the two vertical cylinders located within the stone arch dominate the chamber.
The 30 centimetre diameter cylinders are connected by a chain that passes over a pulley and over 4 metres stroke with a reciprocating action that produces a steady stream rather than the usual pulsing of a single cylinder. The pump rods enter the shaft seen here on the left of the cage. Some say that given the area's abundant supply of coal, it would have been a lot cheaper to have installed a Cornish type engine at surface, but then we'd be denied the exciting experience of seeing this fine example of Victorian engineering in situ. This bold venture enjoyed a brief period of prosperity, but success was short lived due to lack of funds and a weather related inability to provide a constant supply of water. From 1882 to 1890 this great machine lay idle until being put to work again under a new company. At the end of the century poor lead prices forced the mine to close and the engines were forgotten by new age and new technology. Some years later I happened upon the mining museum in Matlock Bath and discovered, much to my surprise, that the Sir Francis engines we had explored lived on, but in miniature. Every little detail was there, both winding and pumping engines accurately recreated just as they would have looked on the day they were installed. There was even a little workbench with its vice and tools ready for use. The extraordinary workmanship of the pristine cogs take on a new life when compared to the original. The model is the work of engineer Frank Peel, sadly no longer with us. But when the mine engines have crumbled to dust, Frank's model will be here to serve as a fitting tribute from a modern engineer to his forebears. <laughs>